one year to go to the next election. Uh, we believe we've uh, identified a few, uh, we have identified a few key uh, themes that are resonating with Canadians. Um, you know, there's, there's no doubt that the idea that uh, this Liberal government has failed to do several things that uh, resonate, you know, failed to get the budget under control, failed to uh, deliver meaningful uh, growth to the middle class and, and failed on our energy sector. Uh, the idea that Canadians are looking at this government as one that has not been able to accomplish things, the, the, the incompetency of it uh, is certainly coming forward and we're going to be uh, uh, highlighting that. Uh, and then the affordability issue as well, uh, the, the, the sense that there's a lot of spending going on, the government's spending an awful lot of money, billions of dollars here and there, uh, but people themselves aren't feeling that, that there's a sense that they're getting by but not getting ahead and, and that's almost making them more angry about the the, the, the levels of spending and the, and the growing deficits. Going after law-abiding firearms owners is easy, it's lazy government, uh, it makes people feel good who don't have an association with firearms, you know, if you're living in Toronto and you, you know, it's not part of your background, it's not part of your recreation, uh, then it's, 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 it's easy to, uh, to be swayed by that, uh, but in fact it doesn't work, it doesn't actually uh, get firearms out of the hands of criminals. So ours will be focused, our plan will be focused on uh, the tough part of governing and that's going after criminals. We've had a lot of consultations with, uh, with police forces across the country and issues around bail reform, issues around uh, sentencing for people who uh, commit firearms offenses, that to me is a more effective approach than uh, asking people who are ignoring laws to follow some on, on orders. You know, in other words, the guy who's transporting heavy, you know, serious narcotics from one part of the city to the other to someone else's turf and he's carrying a gun to, uh, you know, to commit these crimes. He's not all of a sudden going to say, oh, wait a minute, you know, do I need a, a transport permit or now that they made this gun illegal, I don't, I'm breaking all these laws, but I don't want to break that one. It's, it's nonsense and, and it's, it's really unfortunate because it'll give people, it may give some people the illusion of action, uh, but in fact it, it won't do anything. Nobody can look at the difference between NAFTA and the difference between what was just agreed to and think that Canada is in any way better off. And the threshold that Justin Trudeau set himself was that he was going to bring back unimproved NAFTA. Now, had he said to Canadians, I'm going to be very honest, uh, NAFTA is at risk, there's no way we're going to keep 100% of what we have, I'm going to go fight to get as much as I can keep, well, then we would be having a different conversation. Canada has agreed to cap our exports, not just cap, reduce our exports to other countries. So uh, never mind access between Canada and the U.S. on a bilateral uh, level. We've agreed not to sell to other countries so that the U.S. Uh, can fill that void. I've never heard of that in a, uh, a trade agreement where we've agreed to sell less to other countries so that it, the U.S. can sell more. No resolution on steel and aluminum, no resolution on soft. So th there are no gains. We are Canada is measuring our successes in what we preserved, what we didn't have to give up. They're measuring their successes in what they gained. And they gained, we didn't get anything in return. We had a position of opposing the legalization. Our party adopted a position of decriminalization as a preferred uh, option at uh, not our last convention, but the one before. Um, so what, I've, what I have said is that we recognize the new reality, uh, but we will look at the impacts of this and, and, and how it does affect society. I believe that there are going to be areas that we uh, will want to look at where you know, we're day three, uh, so I don't want to get ahead of myself and, and, and say things before the data comes in. I think a responsible uh, leader of a party would, would wait and see what the effects are. Um, but I think things around minimum age of, of, of purchase, you know, minimum age of consumption, the, the consensus seems to be that 18 is very young, brain development goes on well into the 20s. So looking at, at that, looking at allowing the provinces to have more control over things like home grow, several of the provinces have asked for that. We believe that that's a, a reasonable thing to, to, to look at. I, I believe that a lot of people bought into what Trudeau was offering in the last election and then at certain points al along the way uh, there's almost light bulb moments where they realize you know the, the emperor has no clothes and, and, and once you see that you can't unsee that uh, and we saw it uh, first with the uh, attack on small businesses where a whole lot of centrist liberals who uh, you know were very comfortable in Paul Martin's liberal party mm -hmm. who uh, you know understood that in order for a government to spend money and, and provide services that someone had to create the wealth in the first place and they saw a, a complete lack of 
of understanding from this government on that issue. I think the India trip certainly showed that uh, what Trudeau was offering as this uh, grand state, statesman on the world stage was nothing like what he actually, how he actually conducts himself. I think we're seeing that with the massive deficits, with a whole series of issues where people are saying this just isn't the, the Liberal Party that they were used to. The number one piece of feedback I get, uh, well I shouldn't say number one, the number one is uh, you know we need, to, we need to see more of you, <laughs> you, know, you, you need to get out more.